So for those of you uh, just joining us, thank you for coming in. Uh, we have Chris Summers, Irvin Merchant, better known as just plain Merchant, and Vitaly Borko. Um, and this is truly a global little panel we have here. Uh, Vitaly's in Kiev. Chris Summers, you're in Budapest, correct? Correct. And Irvin is in California, oh. Los Angeles? Yep, yeah. and and I'm in uh, Philadelphia, so uh, so we're we're spread around here. We're about to start chatting about uh, all sorts of virtual production things, primarily focusing on all this time code and sync, Genlock, and uh, these sorts of things. So for those of you joining us. Um, online I mean you should have been able to see the profiles of the panelists here I'm going to be learning from them I'm not here as an expert I'm just here to kind of push the conversation along um, but these guys are genuine experts in virtual production and uh, camera technologies and such so we'll be learning from them together uh, if you're watching this after the fact as a YouTube recording you can take a look at the uh, description for information about each of these panelists so I wanted to try and get into the conversation conversation right away and um, start with, you know, all of these technologies uh, for synchronization, they're not always needed for virtual production, right? There's some certain scenarios where we don't need synchronization at all. Um, and I don't know if any of you wanted to talk to that. I mean, there's a lot of people that are like nervous. They're, they're thinking about getting into virtual production. I've got Unreal Engine installed on my computer and all these people are saying I need Genlock, I need Sync, I need XYZ hardware. Um, but there's some scenarios where you don't need that, right? I don't know if, Irfan, um, you might want to bring Yeah, that. I mean, um, there are virtual productions when you're doing animation virtual production, when you're tracking a camera with your Vive tracker and it's all digital and all in virtual environment and you don't have a live feed or a video feed to lock onto, you can pretty much do without Genlock. It doesn't affect it in any way. It's only when you're doing pixel matching and you're doing like precision tracking with a system like Stipe or Moses or Exometry or an optical system that's actually giving you an optical marker tracking in 3D and then you can translate that into Unreal on a camera in the system. Right, so if, go ahead Vitaly. Yeah, yeah saying, go ahead Vitaly. Basically if you're going for a green screen kind of shooting with some actors and Unreal rendering your content on the ground, you indeed don't really need any kind of synchronization, uh, gen lock and stuff like this. Once you go for uh, LED panels, uh, then it, it, it's kind of must have setup. Yeah, and that's a good point. So that even if you're having effectively two sources, right, a live video camera with a green screen that's feeding into Unreal, if the camera's not moving, right. then ultimately the, the image being generated is coming out of Unreal and you, and you don't necessarily need uh, a hard sync. Well, technically, you need it, and the, the, the reason why that imagine you have LED panels and you have 24, 50 hertz, and your image flips. If you just turn on slow mo on your iPhone or phone, you can see those flips slowly changing the image as a skyline sometimes. So, you don't want your shutter uh, to catch the frame in the middle of this process. You want the, all the pixels to, to, to change and then start. Um, taking the light from it on, on your uh, lenses, right? That's why you have to sync the signal for a camera when to start uh, this process, and for LED panels when to start switching the, uh, yeah. the pixels, as well for your video card, when, you, when the video card have to flip the data on the frame buffer. So it's kind of synchronous process across different other pieces that, that there is no way around it. Right. Now, the nice thing is Unreal has the ability to synchronize. If you have a single camera and it's coming in through SDI on an AJA card or Blackmagic card, you can synchronize to that one camera basically passively based on the, the frame cadence from the camera. I, I, there's features in, you can go through the instructions on the AJA or Blackmagic plugins on how to configure that in Unreal Engine, and so you don't necessarily need, like I've got, you know, this, it's obviously not connected right now, but this is, you know, a little Genlock uh, sync generator. Um, that doesn't have to be connected to your board, but, or Unreal will passively sync to the incoming frames, but really that only works with one camera, one video input, right? So, so that really kind of brings us to the scenarios where 
synchronization is really critical. And Vitaly was talking about one in terms of the refresh rate of any kind of screens that are behind you. Um, you know, uh, you know, if you're working with multiple cameras, right, you can't just turn on two cameras and expect that even if they're set to the same frame rate, refresh rate, that they're going to be in any kind of synchronization, right? And, and mostly when you're doing multi-cam or when you're doing multi-computer, because you could have multiple cameras connected to multiple computers, each rendering each camera separately, and then a master com a computer slaving and syncing all the rest of the machines, you need to be able to do that. And because of the multi-cam solution, you definitely have to have gen lock. And for your post process and productions, a lot of people will embed time code in there in multiple different ways so they can track all different cameras being recorded on ISOs and to be able to go into post and edit and run it through a multi-cam edit in Premiere or any other software that you're looking at. Right. So, um, you know, we've got the equipment that needs to be synchronized, but there's another scenario too, even if you're shooting with a single camera, if you're going to start moving that camera Absolutely. with a human crew, uh, you're, you're going to need sync for that as well. Um, so that would allow you to sync with any tracking data, whether you're using, you know, the Moses or Stipe or something like that, um, or, or mocap, you can use a full mocap system. Go ahead, Vitaly. Go ahead, Vitaly. Yeah, sure. Um, when you start working with the tracking and the cameras and different feeds, uh, that's where time code starts playing an important role, especially when you want to compose something on a post or XR, which is pretty cool thing these days, on the AR layer. You got to feed the time code into your GenLock signal to your video stream, and you have to have the time coded uh, tracking data, either type or um, Moses and what happened then we really have quite a few interesting tools. I think one is time and data monitor where you can sync and align different uh, time codes. So if you're well video feed always coming with a little bit of delay and the tracking data coming the recent one. So there's a little bit of offset. So having any kind of overlay will result in a mismatch. That's why there is a tools where you can synchronize both those feeds and you can tell, like, all right, tracking, can you pick the values for a time code signal that came with the video feed? So it's a little bit kind of taking buffer out for a few milliseconds or whatever delays to align them and interpolate in the right way. Yeah, and this is exactly where I kind of wanted to go into and, and, and reach out to Chris here, um, because he's worked with audio and, and camera departments for virtually his entire career. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of point out, and I'm really glad you brought this up, Vitaly, that, you know, time code and gen lock are needed in some scenarios. These are actually two different things. A lot of newcomers kind of, I don't know, meld those two things together, think one is the other, or, you know, if I have time code, I've got gen lock, but they're, they're not the same. So, Chris, I, could you review a little bit of, like, you know, on set, regardless of whether we're using virtual production or not, time code and gen lock are constantly used, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about those. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, constantly used, and as you said, not the same thing. You know, you could have time code boxes on multiple cameras. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be gen locked. And I always take it back to the film days. You know, gen lock for me is having the, the, the shutters fire in phase. They could be on the same tyco, but they could be out of phase with each other. And then you're going to have that mismatch. And I imagine you would have exactly the same thing in Unreal Engine. If you had a LED in the background, your eyes are going to see this mismatch because it's going to be out of phase. So gen locking is essentially for us having the, those shutters go exactly at the same time. Um, certainly have done situations where we've had to not with green screen, but had to recreate something virtually later. And we had five cameras, uh, ARRI Alexas, with their uh, own ARRI system, which is a typical, you know, master camera, which is synced to four others. And they're all, it's a, it's a hard cable system. Uh, and that's how they do their internal uh, phasing, let's say, to sync everything up. Um, and that's really helpful and important because again you, you could do it by eye later but it's it's you're going to see it you're going to see that thing where you go something just doesn't look right you don't know what necessarily we we might know <laughs> looking at it but the audience will just know something's not right here you know 
So from the camera side, it's super important. Time code happens a lot, but the gen locking thing will come down to a very specific situation where we have LED wall or a, something that has to do with a very specific VFX I'm pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that's uh, absolutely correct. Uh, think of the gen lock as a pulse in a system. It's just generating a beat at a moment. And it's like the melan mel uh, the device that they use with violins. It's just a timing device. It gives you take, take, take. So all the systems are syncing to that sound at the beat. And then time code gives you the reference of frame by frame by frame as the time frame goes through. And you can get that in multiple frame rates as in you could do... Uh, 24, 2398, 2997, 30, 60, all different variables of that. And Genlock basically will run at 60 frames primarily. Right. So the, the time code is mostly it's a data tag. It's like this is when this happened as far as this particular instrument uh, is aware of anyway, whereas the Genlock itself is the metronome that Correct. keeps everything in play. And, you know, if you've got, you know, again, I got this little Genlock generator. It's got six outputs. Um, this could actually have incorrect values, you know, in terms of synchronization. If I've got one camera that's like 100 feet away in, in an auditorium and one's like five feet away and I use different length cables, right? I mean, if over the course of a half an hour or so, I could end up with discrepancies in terms of the sync with those. Is that right? Or is that incorrect? It looks like, Irfan, you're, you're, I, I might be yeah. off on that. Right. Uh, uh, with the cables, I think up to 300 feet, I've never, I haven't seen that happen. What, what okay, does great. happen is if your time code starts slipping, if you're using like a time code buddy or something that's a portable device, that you jam sync to something and then you walk away and that's your time code jam. And then you walk away and sometimes that will slip depending on how the settings are done in each camera and you know how many times it was switched on and off or when you replaced a drive or battery, that could happen. Uh, Genlock, if it's cabled in, I have very rarely seen it have issues in the length of the cable, but things have changed. That could happen. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I technically that, that it right. happens, Go ahead. especially in... in uh, I came from virtual reality world. We worked a lot with the cave systems and it's a big uh, giant installation of big projectors and stuff like this. So there is a attenuation of this uh, signal. It's, I think it's five volts or something. And if you have a hundred meters long signal, it can go away. So um, there is spe specific devices, amplifiers that can kind of repeat right. the signal and, uh, and make it work. But the problem exists. So you have to keep in mind how far away your device can send the signal to usually it's how it expects. So now we have a better understanding, or at least we've covered a little bit, the differences between Genlock and timecode, um, and a little bit of how it works, right? So the Genlock is putting out a pulse, and we're using that to synchronize. Um, I guess there's a variety of Genlock generators, right? There's some that are rack mounted, and others that are smaller panels. So we've, we've kind of got that. Um, how do these two things then, and I think this may be a Vitaly question or Irfan, you know, when the camera is moving, how do these two things really come into play when we're talking about a moving camera? Vitaly, you want to take that? Yeah, well, moving camera is always a problem because there's a naturally, physically, once you start moving, you're tracking data coming with a little bit of delay. There is no real solution except of some kind of prediction there's maybe some smart AI yeah, systems in the future will be giving your values ahead of time a little bit, but it's still a little bit not perfect. Or systems like motion control, if you have a rail or robot and you can predict or calculate ahead of time your trajectory, that will be a solution as well. So you can send this data ahead of time for a frame or, or a little bit of delay to have your tracking correctly and positioned. Other than this, it's, it, it's a little bit error. So you can only increase it by having more FPS, which means more content optimization, um, increasing the FOVs, but again, it's, it's kind of limited solution. It works for majority of cases. Yeah, if I'm, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, um, well, actually a couple of things. One is that if you're moving a camera and your foreground and background isn't in sync, so when you put your time code or your gen lock in and you set a frame rate in your engine, it actually tries to maintain that frame rate as you're doing production. 
So even if you might be getting like 80 frames, but then it'll sink down to 24 when you hit play. And that allows that to maintain a frame rate in there and get within the range of frames that you're looking for. And that helps with that. And, you know, if you've got multiple systems running simultaneously, you want to make sure that they're all at the same you know, phase and they're all running in the same gen lock so they can be switching between one and the other and not have any cross slipping between the cameras and the background. And so that just allows you to make everything solid for your virtual production. Great. So all of these things that we've been talking about are synchronizing all sorts of production gear, right? So we're talking about the, the audio feeds, multiple cameras, the Unreal Engine machines. But then we get into a whole nother level of sync when we get into LED panels where we need to synchronize multiple quadro boards within a single computer or even across multiple computers. And of course, this is Vitaly's domain. So maybe, uh, Vitaly, do you want to share a little bit about those synchronization issues? Yeah, well, yeah, sure. Um, well, it's important to understand that when Unreal outputs its frame, when you're saying, all right, our frame is finished and let it go to the DirectX or previously OpenGL system, it doesn't mean that this frame immediately appears on a video card output. It happens that there's a Windows desktop manager system in the Windows that actually, you now when you do Alt-Tab, you have all those nice fancy previews of dynamics and animations that you have in other applications. This is what Windows does, and the same happens to our frame that we output from Unreal. Windows overtake control what happens once Unreal give out the frame. And this process, there is a few ways, it's quite a low level stuff that it goes from Windows to drivers, DirectX, video card buffer, and so on and so on. There is a few things to keep in mind uh, while setting up your stage. The number one rule that your application must be in a full screen mode. It means it can be in windowed full screen, but you have to take all the pixels available on your desktop system. You cannot have a taskbar, task bar. you cannot have one pixel somewhere aside, it has to be a full screen. Those windows automatically detects that all the pixels cover the application and give us the ability uh, to, to enter specific mode that we named. Uh, there's independent flip, um, another type of flips on the low level of the Windows system. What happened then, once Windows gives control, full control to application, then we can enable our sync on NVIDIA level. You might, so there's a difference in policies within the display settings. And a second um, sync policy, that's where Quadro capabilities use it. Um, and Quadro is another interesting story. What happens with the visual production setups and Quadro, I will put away a little bit of hardware details on Sync, but the whole setup on a high level um, looks like you have to have different combinations of uh, Quadro Sync capabilities. There are two major things, I would say. You can sync to incoming GenLock signal through SDI, and you can utilize their frame lock through daisy chain uh, connection. This is a different systems, but in case of virtual production needs, they work simultaneously. You have to have your gene lock to be entered in your master computer that will drive through frame lock connection through data chain or other machines. Uh, that's, that's the basic need that you have to build if you want to have and ensure uh, that your outputs output in so, the sync. So just to review, let's just say we have multiple machines, each machine has multiple Quadro boards, then they would also, and if we're gonna use Genlock to drive the synchronization, each of those machines would have either an AJA or Blackmagic, some kind of board that can accept the Genlock signal from the studio. And then that Genlock can drive the synchronization within each of those computers, so then they'll stay in sync. And if you have multiple computers then driving the, the various LED panels behind the studio or you know, in, in view of the camera, all of those panels would then be getting refreshed in synchronization together. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. Just... So your master machine receiving an external genlock signal that pulse how fast, uh, I mean, with the timings of those switches and it's press the signal over those cabling, uh, they look like Ethernet or other machines. This will ensure that all the frames flipped at the same time in a cluster environment. So it goes like from Unreal to DVM to video card buffer 
and the pulse drives this uh, flip uh, on a hardware level. And then in terms of the hardware with the quadros, there is yet another, there's a synchronization board that's needed, right? So if you have, let's yeah. say you've got your Blackmagic board getting your Genlock in, you've got a pair of quadros, you'll still need the quadro synchronization board, correct? That right, it's a G-Sync card. The G-Sync card? Yeah. Yeah, this is where all the cabling for sync goes. This is where your master PC receiving incoming Genlock signal. This is where from goes and as a daisy chain, your frame lock connection. Well, this way, uh, in a cluster, you don't need Azure or any black magic board on every single machine. Cluster uses just to render uh, frames. Usually, people use uh, the capture cards on composure uh, machines where you need to capture and save these frames. The cluster machines aren't coming with Asia or black magic. So, if you don't have an AJA or black magic board, what, how else would you get Genlock in? Or just or do you need to? Board. Yeah, it's, you have Quadros, Quadro, let's say RTX something, and you have uh, Quadro Sync. They have a cable. So Quadro Sync board have all those G-Log, frame lock inputs, and it, through this special cable, it drives the video card for a frame flip. Gotcha. Uh, okay, so that is, I, I don't have one of these. I have, so this is this is good for for me to know. And then it's important to know that again, you can get started with virtual production on your own, and it could be a, a consumer RTX or even GTX board without these synchronization connections, as long as you're not driving, you know, you're trying to drive a huge multi-output uh, system with lots of. Uh, LED panels or something like that. I mean, you couldn't use you couldn't use two consumer grade RTX or GTX boards uh, to drive multiple LED panels and expect them to be able to synchronize to one another. Well, right? uh, not really. We are working toward uh, multi GPUs and increasing the performance of the whole setup. But at this moment, only one video card utilizes it technically by, by Unreal. So I will not recommend to go for multi GPU for now yet. Yes. So that's a good, that's a great point. So it sounded like Irfan, you had something to say on that. Worth yeah, it's just GPUs. that, uh, you know, Unreal only works with one GPU, a single GPU. So having multiple GPUs, as Vitaly said, is kind of overkill, unless you're doing pre-baking and doing some of the lighting bakes and then you need to bake that in through Swarm, then it's a different story having multiple GPUs because you're rendering out frames. But even, and, and but if you're using a large array of computers, to project a large file on multiple LED screens in multiple sections. Like Vitaly said, every one of those machines needs to have a G-Sync card. And the 6,000, which was the last card that already had that, it was combined together. And with the 8,000, you have to buy the G-Sync card separately and install it. And there's Good always the so precision timing, PTP timing in Unreal Engine now, which also allows the engine to see the time code and make sure that everything is running smoothly between multiple machines. This is, this is great. So at the moment, as of this recording, here we are, July 23, 2020, for the most part, uh, you know, Unreal uh, does not actually leverage multiple GPUs other than like if you're doing your light baking renders, et cetera. Yeah. But if you're, when you're doing your, your live frames out, it's really only leveraging a single GPU. So a more efficient arrangement then is single quadro with a, with a G-Sync synchronization board getting the sync from, you know, from Chris's camera department or something like that. And, um, and then just multiple machines, depending on how many actual quadros you might want to drive. And right. um, the quadros are the ones that interface with the synchronization board. Those are, that's not a feature that's typically on any of the consumer grade boards. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to get that no, I accurate don't think so. synchronization. Yeah. Cool. Um, that's all the questions that I actually had prepared. I don't know if there's anything else that anyone on the, on the panel, you know, wants to add or point out at this point. We also, I've been encouraging attendees, by the way, uh, to uh, post your questions into the Q&A panel. And by the way, if there is usually a vote up option, if there's a question that's already been posted that you're interested in. So I'll get to those in just a second. Just wanted to let the attendees know about that. Um, wondering about the uh, panelists, though, if you guys have anything else that you think should be said that, that we haven't already brought up as, you know, from my little novice questions. Uh, I can only talk from the camera side, really. Please, um, Chris, enlighten us. Uh, 
just from the camera side, I see there's a question about uh, taking time code over HDMI. It's from Matt Workman, the Matt Workman. Yes. Uh, and if you could uh, gen up to that. I'm not sure that you can, um, but my experience, I'm just thinking back to previous things. You know, I've been on a show, we've done... 3D rigs, custom 3D rigs, and at, at that time it was Red One cameras, and I believe at that time we were accessing the camera through the GPIO port. So there's other ways to get into the camera, and even on like the Alexa systems, they're not gen locking over the SDI, they, they're entering through the data port again, and that's, you know, through their own custom cable and own protocols. So I guess that's a phone call to some of the camera manufacturers to see if there's another way to get in. But yeah, traditionally it's going to be over SDI as we know, but that's not your only way in necessarily. Right. I mean, if you had the time code in your signal originally coming out of the camera, it might travel through HDMI, but Genlog definitely won't because sure. that's a separate HDMI or a BNC port that has to be on the card for it to accept Genlog source. And as far as I remember, all the HDMI cards uh, do not have uh, a BNC on them for the Genlog. Uh, but if you do get a black magic card that has video and uh, HDMI together combined it is an extreme card, on that card you might be able to apply the gen lock on the video port and have the HDMI source coming in and that's a possibility to work. Right. I know on the, some of the AJA models have the HDMI input as well as a BNC reference input. Right. Um, and ultimately, though, I mean, you could you have to be careful because you could actually introduce delay, right? So the HDMI frame could come in and the AJA card's not going to release it until it gets the Genlock tick. So, you know, there's, there's a little bit of things you need to be careful with. I think if you're working with a single camera with HDMI out, my understanding is that the time code is generally like a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema, for example. I think it shares its time code at the HDMI. Yeah but it's not Genlock, so that there's no Genlock pulse. However, you can configure Unreal Engine to you know, watch for the incoming frames and synchronize its rendering to the cadence of the incoming frames. So it's not genuine, it's not Chris Summers Genlock, um, but it, it's a form of you know, synchronizing Unreal Engine to the real world camera. It's a little bit better than, than not setting up that configuration. So, cool. I'm just going to uh, consider Matt's question answered. It's very um, interesting, Efren, that you were saying that Unreal Engine will keep track. So, will it like flag up? Will it give you a notification like, hey, something's out of sync, something like yeah, that? Yeah, it'll just, it'll just either crash or it'll just give you errors popping in all over the place. Because yeah. when yeah. we were using the Moses plugin, uh, when there's a sync issue, it starts flagging everything automatically you'll see red notifications come through, uh, things will fail, and then it'll just lock up or shut down. Right, so just work. I, I know I, I was exchanging ideas with a, a, someone who was new with VP, and, and they commented about that never seen a program that kicked out as many warnings and errors as Unreal Engine did. <laughs> and But one of the things that I try to share with folks is that, you know, Unreal, it's not so much a program as it is a C++ library. I mean, literally every time you run it, you're, you're compiling code in the background. Unreal's you know, great claim to fame is that its developer UI um, makes that process a little bit more behind the scenes for artists and such. But genuinely at its core, it's a C++ compiler uh, system. So uh, yeah, th there's a lot of, for those of us that code quite a bit, you know, warnings, errors. Yeah, we see those all the time. <laughs> uh, so the next question that's in the queue here is uh, how would this how, sync with an NDI source? Um, I don't know. I, I, I've used a lot of NDI, and my belief is that there is no synchronization being passed by NDI, that that's just not part of the protocol itself, that it's just passing image uh, data as Ethernet packets. And so you really don't get to preserve any kind of hardware camera sync information uh, if you're connecting video via NDI. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has a um, experience with that. No, I haven't messed with NDI that much. We use it to import sources in from multiple machines to bring sources into apply in the windows that we're building in there. So 
we haven't had an issue with it and we are processing images through Resolume and through a couple of other softwares. And I mean, we've never, we haven't had a need to sync an NDI source. So I couldn't tell you any yeah. further than that. I mean, I'm, I'm using it now. I actually have two machines. So that I have my Unreal machine that's generating the, the virtual studio around me. And the computer that I have on Zoom talking with everybody, it's feeding its display over NDI into the Unreal. So that's how I get my little holographic yeah. display. But the synchronization of that is not critical. And, you know, if, Irfan, if you raised your hand and lowered it, you would, you would really see the, the actual lag involved. It would be, it would be pretty horrendous. So, um, all right. So we'll consider that question addressed. Uh, what is considered acceptable delay for virtual production? It's going to depend on, on the scenario. Vitaly, do you want to address that at all? Well, it's, it's, it depends on how fast your movements are, especially uh, how fast you move the camera. Usually it's like five to eight frames. This is something you do have for sure. So um, again, it very depends on the project. If you're running the slow scenes, slow motion, kind of slow paced uh, shot, there's no problem with this. If you're running faster, well then yeah, you will have some delays, and either it's acceptable or not. It will be particularly on the past um, when you try to align uh, any kind of time code data in the past, either it's acceptable or not. So it's, it's per case, I will say. And that's a really great point, too, because some of what um, makes virtual production successful is the design of the shots and the camera work that's used in the shots to begin with. Um, if, if you move the camera very gently and slowly, right. you can get uh, away with you're going to have less sensitivity. Right. Well, the thing is that, um, you know, there's, if you're using Pixitope or zero density, uh, one of the virtual production uh, overlay softwares like that, they actually have delay built into the programming of how they send up the UI. So they're actually managing that delay up to seven frames. And, and, and if you're using Ultimat, you can get up to seven frames of delay where your background and foreground are out of sync because your background is lagging on your render and is still catching up to you. And you can have up to seven frames in Ultimat uh, in 11. I don't know what the frame amount is in 12. Uh, might be a little better uh, because that's a much better processor, but it's also processing 4K. Um, so you know, it all depends on how much camera movement you have, how sharp your camera movement is. If you're doing gentle gliding motion and your frames are running a little slower, you can get away with four or five frames, but you, it'll catch up to you at the end and you'll see it at some point. It's also, um, you know, if your subject is in frame and you're not seeing their feet touching the floor right. uh, and you're not seeing that that seam between the floor and the led panel you have a little bit more play you know with that gap it's yeah. it's when especially when the that floor and the seam is actually visible and, and there are shots that, that do that um that then you be you get a little more critical and then before we actually opened up the webinar vitaly you had brought up a really cool setup for, for getting around some of these synchronization issues, and that was to actually use motion control, right? So that you could effectively program a motion controlled real life camera and have that synchronized with a virtual camera and effectively eliminate any effect of delay because you know precisely when the frames in the real world are being acquired and you're just rendering even a little bit ahead of time, rendering the frames that are gonna match up to that, whether they're going to LED or not, right? Yeah, it works, works perfectly for kind of live events, for this augmented reality setups, but not really well for any kind of visual production for cinematography. I don't think any of the DOPs will like this idea of having to program it, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, if you get every chance, uh, Nicholas, you should get Richard Widgery from Take 4D out of London. Uh, he does a lot of robotics and local control stuff. Uh, worked on Aladdin, uh, Assassin's Creed, all the P Potter movies. Uh, and he has developed his own software, which allows you to sync up multiple sources, reprogram your cameras, and readjust if you change lenses and rotations and things like that. And gives that feed directly into Unreal to accommodate the rendering at a faster rate. So uh, definitely uh, one of the people to have on a panel someday to talk about what he does with that and how magical his software is. 
Ah, oh, thanks for bringing that up. That that, and I'll have to uh, keep a close eye on my university's engineering department anytime they're getting rid of like some kind of industrial robotic arm. So, um, okay. So Michael asks about: uh, Is there a way to genlock multiple quadros in one computer? And I think we actually kind of I think he asked that before we got to the topic in our own discussion, and that we know yeah. that now that uh, Unreal really doesn't leverage that. So I'm just going like, to consider that answer. Well, let me ask for a little um, bit. Quadro sync board have four inputs so you can sync up to four video cards on the same machine uh, however multi gpu isn't the case for now so it doesn't uh, make much of a sense having such a setup so you could synchronize the cards but unreal is only going to be leveraging one of them anyway yeah, technically you can do 16 uh, display outputs in sync i mean if you go for any kind of big large mosaic setup uh, it will work no problem but not for Unreal yet, because. Gotcha. So the next question is actually, can a, can a master have a quadro and send sync from the master to the rest in any way we can use RTX 2080s? So that still comes to the idea that, I mean, for LED panel use, you wouldn't want to do that because you couldn't precisely sync your RTX 2080s. Um, you might be able to use that for multiple video feed outputs. You could, you could synchronize, you know, with Genlock, a camera and video frames coming out of Unreal from different machines, but not to the precision that you would want to drive LED panels. I mean, you might be able to use that for a multicam live broadcast or something like that, so that you could have multiple cameras with multiple Unreal virtual environments and be able to cut between them. But, but they're not precisely in sync for LEDs. Uh, would you guys have a basic diagram or schematic illustrating the basic connections, how these boards and boxes would be configured? Well, that's a, that's a good one. Um, um, there's actually a diagram on Unreal's uh, virtual production PDF that they have on there. There is a diagram in there that kind of explains that. And if you download the resource from the Unreal website, you should be able to get that diagram from there. Yeah, that's the uh, Unreal Engine Virtual Production Field Guide, field I think guide. it is, right? Yes, Something like that. that. So if, Google that, and that'll come up. And if, I, if, I, my, if my memory is working, I'll try to put the link in the description of the YouTube recording. So great. Thanks for bringing that and one up. And display feature brief might have this diagrams as well. Might. The end display what? Feature brief. Ah, the feature good. OK. Cool. All right, someone asks if, uh, it's Josh asking if RTX 2080 or GPU without sync, but still using a Blackmagic or AJA card, Genlock, does the engine sync the output from the capture sync, or does this output signal still need to be frame synced? Well, let, let, let me explain it on a little, little bit low technical level what's happening. Imagine your processor or your monitor or any kind of display device um, it reaches the video card port and says what you have available to display. And it goes one by one, pixel to read, re RGB values just to display them. And the problem is that you don't know what exactly sits on the video card output. It can be in any frame. And if you have multiple computers, those frames can be randomly flipped at any given point of time. So, or they can be flipped right in the process of uh, reading the buffer. That's why you might so in games, they have this vSync value to ensure that the frame on the video card output is already rendered and it's not going to be flipped unless a uh, video display device finished the reading of those pixels. So technically having those RTXs results in this random flips of the data, actual RGB values on the video card output that can be read uh, by the synced, um, let's say, LED processor by GenLock. So you'll have a tiering, uh, basically. That's why any kind of consumer grade video cards simply isn't applicable for clusters at all. So that's not going to work for LED panels. Um, but if you are potentially bringing in multiple cameras into Unreal, you can still use a, the RTX board. Like you said, you might have a a random extra flip, but effectively the alt, the finished image, like in my case, I'm doing green screen, Unreal is doing the composite. So the frames coming out of, now I am using Quadro, but 
the frames coming out of that are already composited and in theory, you know, synchronized, they're in the same cadence. So I might drop a frame, but, um, you know, because I'm not outputting to an LED panel, I'm not going to experience any kind of tearing or anything like that. This whole, this frame is generated in its entirety and then ultimately sent out SDI into uh, my, my other video mixing board. Yeah. So Chroma there are scenarios. Story, right? Yeah, there are scenarios where you can go ahead and use an RTX uh, board and, um, you know, output frames. You usually, ideally, you know, if you've got an AJA or Blackmagic board, you know, um, I'm finding that it's it's really convenient to output the final composite from Unreal onto an SDI out in one of those right. boards, and then uh, send it off to whatever the video production. I mean, Irfan, you, you use this stuff a lot, right? Yeah. Well, the one thing I wanted to say to the gentleman who's asking this question is, if he's once you've gen locked the card initially, the frames that are coming out don't need to have frame synchronization because you're putting it either into a switcher or a display. And um, both of those are asynchronous in a way. So you don't have to have the, have to do anything on the frames that are coming out. They're already synced and they're just locked video at that point. Great. So next question here, uh, what about Atmos recorders that have HDMI and SDI out that offer Genlock? So the thing is that the Atmos recorder probably has a Genlock input. So you still need an external Source, Chris, maybe, have you ever used one of these re outboard recorders? Yeah, but that's going to be in because, I mean, surely your, your Genlock source should be the camera shutter. That's your master. So, yeah, it'll take Genlock. Or, or a sync but, generator that's feeding or, into that or, camera. Or a sync generator that's feeding into it. But that's, that's going to be your primary, you know, everything should be feeding off that shutter firing. So I'm trying to think of the use case. You'll just be putting Genlock into that. And then right, so you don't have the rolling shot, the rolling of the video because of the frame rate, because it certainly syncs to some frame rates and it doesn't to some. And I've seen that issue happen a couple of times. So when you add Genlock, it just stabilizes the signal. That's pretty oh. much it. All right. Um, this one I think is going to be a Chris question. Uh, there's a question about: Is there any problem trying to get time code from an audio source? Sometimes Gen 10 doesn't lock the time code. Uh, time code from an audio source. Well, it really was, that depends. Your, was that your audio synchronization there, or was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's silly season with mosquitoes right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Old school synchronization there. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Still works. <laughs> Still yep. works. Um, it. Uh, sorry. What was the question again? So the question is about using uh, an audio source for time code. Um, but again, I think, you know, time code is not sync, right? So right. it's not sync, but, but again, you'll, you'll have a, you'll have a master clock, you know, someone's going to, time code is going to be sunk off of some master clock somewhere. The, the yeah. sound mixer might have it, but then again, you, you, you there's, there's a master clock somewhere. So you, you're syncing off of something. You could be taking it from sound that could be pushing it into the camera, but then, you know, it's, it's, it should all be the same. So if your camera does support using an audio input feed for time code, then the, the camera's going to tag the frames with whatever incoming time code source sure. it's being fed, right? Sure. It's being Very often jammed. we'll have the, tenti the, tentacle, the tentacle sync or the, the old, the ambient uh, nano locket boxes were really good as well. And you know, the, like the nano lockets, they, they work on an ambient like wireless network. So they're constantly reclocking as soon as within you're in proximity of your sound mixer it has the base station, it'll be constantly rechecking the clock to make sure it's in sync throughout the day. Cool. All right. Uh, I've got a question. Is there any way to sync a 4K camera with a tri-sync? Or would we need to acquire a 4K Genlock box? I think there's a couple things being convolved there. I don't know, Chris, I, I think this is another camera department question. Well, I mean, this, the K of the camera should be irrelevant because if we're talking about synchronization and Genlock, um, I'm just looking for the question if I can make, 
It, but, uh, uh, for me, it's yeah, the, the, the four, the four K, yeah, the four K should be is is irrelevant in terms of in terms yeah. of the gen lock. It should it's a, it's a different protocol that we're talking about. All we're looking for, yeah. you know, it even goes even goes to film cameras. We did the same thing on film cameras when we shoot plates with Vista Vision cameras, and in that take you take the two cameras up no and K. you have a, no a cinematography <laughs> electronics uh, strobe light, and you you know just like a timing light that you'd use in your car engine, and you make sure that. You hit the phase button on the side of the camera, you make sure that the shutters are actually in phase with each other. So that's the concept. Yeah, I think Irfan kind of alluded to this before. And again, the this Genlock Sync um, generator, it has BNC. The, that's the, the name of the connector. Yeah. Um, that's not necessary. Like SDI is a, is a communication format. standard that goes over BNC connector using cables. Um, and so even though this this Genlock generator, you know, it's kind of labeled on the background, you know, on the back, it, it has 1080i and, and P, et cetera. But really it's, it's putting out a pulse. It's not, it's not relevant. The resolution isn't relevant. It's the, the cadence of the, of the frames. So 59.94 versus 23.98 versus 24. I mean, the, this, this is essentially the, the pulses being generated analog going out over that cable that happens to be connected over a BNC connector cable. But that is actually entirely independent of the actual video material itself. So the, the video will be going out from the camera over a different BNC connector that happens to be SDI probably. Um, and, and that could be 4K, 8K, apparently now 12K. Uh, so yeah, great. All right, we'll just take a couple more questions because I you know the, the panelists, I really appreciate that you're here and uh, I don't want to monopolize all your time. So we'll, we'll just take a couple more questions. Um, there's one here is, is there a low budget virtual production setup possible uh, to realize home office? Is there an Unreal Engine project template to start with? Oh, 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 I can answer this one. This is like the one question I can actually answer because you guys are the brains behind this. But um, if you install Unreal Engine uh, using the Epic installer, go to the Learn tab, scroll down a little bit, and look for Virtual Studio. And if you download that, you'll um, it, it has a load of props and sets and actually pre-configured studios. The, this little setup that I made here is the, the desk is from that set and so are the, the back walls. Um, and so that lets you get started and it's all free. So you can download that. You will still need a computer that's capable of running Unreal Engine. And if you're going to be doing video input and output, um, you know, we're I've, I'm helping a lot of people with virtual production these days, and the ones that have Macs are struggling a little bit because the Macs are a little bit more constrained about how they allow video signals to pass from cameras into various software that's installed. Um, so, you know, make sure that the computer specifications you have are good for Unreal. But, yeah, um, if you've got a decent GPU board, you can install Unreal for free, and there is a a virtual studio that you can download for free and, and get started with that. So I, I will take that question and uh, finally way, I get to be. Uh, we are preparing <laughs> yeah, the ahead. next version of the template project for LED panels. The one I uploaded a while ago got updates, many new features and samples added. So I hope it will be released in the coming days as well. So, so do you have a timeline of when that, when we should be expecting that new uh, template for end display? In the coming days, the template itself almost ready. We've got a little bit of kind of video guide how to enable the core idea that we moved all the features and all the sub levels into the plugin. So you technically just drop this plugin folder in your project. You can connect sub level and display and use all the features and blueprints and explore it on your own almost in any project. Awesome. All That's right. fantastic, Vitaly. Yeah, thanks. All right. So I think we'll go with one more question and I'm just trying to see if there's one, I guess I'll just go with the, uh, let's see, for, for green screen, let's, I'm going to David, I'll just, for green screen virtual production, do you still recommend getting a Blackmagic Decklink card with SDI inputs as opposed to using a pre-existing HDMI port? Uh, would that reduce any delay in latency? I think Erfin, maybe this one might be something for you since you mostly um, work with green screen and broadcast yeah we definitely recommend getting an sdi input card because it just if we have gen lock it helps 
also some of the HDMI ports, you know, they don't always process well. And some of the ports that are pre-existing in HDMI ports, they don't support video at certain resolution. You know, there's a lot of issues with it and they use some weird codecs sometimes for compression. And so it gets a little glitchy and uh, not the best idea. Sorry. Good to know. Um, I'll just share one one last answer. There's someone that actually, it was Matt Workman, um, the Matt Workman, asked uh, for my virtual setup, how am I keeping my audio in sync? And the answer to that is I have an outboard audio unit. It's a, a shark. Um, I'll have to look that up. And so I've got, uh, let me just look at the display right now. Yeah, 290 milliseconds of audio delay in my analog pipe. So um, the, the full pipe is that Unreal Engine on one machine is outputting SDI over to an ATEM unit, and that's what Zoom sees. And the audio is being fed into that ATEM unit, and the audio chain has a 290 millisecond delay on that. So uh, that's what's keeping my audio. And it's not dead. It's not Genlock synced. It's probably not even Chris Summers killing a mosquito synced, but it's close enough. So. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone on the panel. I really appreciate that you joined uh, this and shared. I think the information is fantastic. I'll be posting the recorded session on YouTube so that folks hopefully can refer to this as they're getting into synchronization issues with their virtual production. Um, I don't know if, uh, I guess most of us, I think Vitaly and Irfan, we're both, you know, you can find us lurking on, the, on Matt's Facebook Unreal oh, yeah, absolutely. virtual production group. I think we're all um, part of some... all the virtual production groups on Facebook now at this point. Yeah, there, there's there's quite a few of them. Um, Chris, I don't know if there's any social media sites. I know that I run into you on uh, Discord in Alex Lindsay's office yeah. hours Discord. I don't know if you have I'm, any I'm in that, that group. You... I'm in the Unreal group as well on, on Facebook. Okay. You can catch me there. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah, hit us up. All right. So folks know where to find us. All right. Everyone, thank you, attendees, for joining. Uh, we ended up with, we have about 70 people watching right now. Uh, panelists, thank you again. I really appreciate that you were here. And with that, I am going to wrap it up, and maybe we'll do this again sometime. Absolutely. All thank right. you so much, guys. Bye. Take Thanks, care. Everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.